Hello, welcome. I'm Linda Lamp, and I'm here with my co-host, Mary Ardania, and we are doing our podcast, Let's Become a Beloved Society, Conversations Illuminating, Illuminating Your Path to Wholeness. And today we have a couple of very interesting questions. We're grateful to um, our watchers who submitted uh, the question. How do we deal with a toxic parent or someone who is a narcissist? And um, it's, this is a really, really important topic because many of us were raised by toxic parents. And, and many of us, unfortunately, carry that toxicity in us and allow it to influence our current relationships and we don't even realize it. And so it's, I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk about this in, especially in relationship to how do we create a beloved society when we have so many toxic people walking around. And if you've been listening to our shows, it's no surprise to you what I'm about to say, but that this is a part of what we call the chain of pain. This is a generational thing that exists in society and in all society where when we are broken ourselves and we don't know it and we aren't taking steps to heal ourselves, we end up passing our brokenness on to our children. We don't have any other choice because we don't know any better. And so what the planet is filled with, and really, I'll speak just about America because America is what I know the best. It's where I live. It's what I hear about on a daily basis. It's what I observe. We are a really broken, broken society. And, and, and we don't even know it. The ways we can know it are to look around at the violence and, and, and the, the lack of kindness that exists in day-to-day -day business and the way we're treated by people and the way we see other people treating other people, the way we see parents treating their children in public sometimes. The number of homeless people on the street in any major city and a lot of not major ones. The, the number of homeless people, the number of, here's something. I just found this out last night and I am still rather speechless. How about the number, not just the number of people who don't have enough food to eat, who don't make enough money, who aren't paid enough right. to live on the wages that they make in right. the country that they live in. Right. How about the fact that the food bank the food banks in this country have the military bases as some of their largest clients. How about that? That's horrible. So this toxicity that we live in is fluid. It's everywhere. It's influencing everything. And it comes about because of our individual brokenness. So there are a lot of people in the world who are trying to fix things by looking outward and, and manipulating what they're seeing when what every human being needs to do first is look inward at themselves and how they are creating their experience, what they're contributing to their experience. Now, let's bore in on this toxic parent idea. And, and let's, let me back up. Let's first define a narcissist 
it isn't that all toxic parents are narcissists, but a lot of times you might even be with a toxic parent and not realize it. And it's because they're a narcissist and you just don't understand that behavior. And so there is a, um, there is a, a good definition and I had it pulled up. Oh, here we go. It's, it's typically at this point called a narcissistic personality disorder. Um, and you, if you're curious, uh, you can even Google like narcissistic personality disorder test. And, and you can answer the questions and see where you, uh, where you, where you score uh, on that test or take it, you know, uh, and score it for the person that you're suspecting is a narcissist and see what the score comes up. So the official manual uh, of the American Psychiatric Association that classifies and, and defines mental health disorders, narcissistic personality disorder, or NPD, is a pattern of grandiose self-importance and a lack of empathy, which typically begins in early adulthood. So here are just some examples of what a person with a narcissistic personality disorder might do. Uh, exaggerate their achievements and talents or expect to be recognized as superior without accomplishments to support it. Be preoccupied with fantasies of success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Believe that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood or should associate with other high or special status people. They require excessive admiration. They have a sense of entitlement or unreasonable expectations of overly favorable treatment, or they expect automatic compliance with their expectations. They take advantage of others to achieve their requirements. They lack empathy and they're willing to recognize or identify with the feelings and, and they're unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings or needs of others. They're often envious of others or they believe that others are envious of them. And they uh, will demonstrate arrogant or better than attitudes and behaviors. So um, there's some, there are some more things here. Um, they'll use gaslighting. Uh, if they're, especially if they're abusive, if they're physically abusive in addition to being narcissistic, they'll use gaslighting to make the survivor believe that, that their memories of events are inaccurate or blown out of proportion, right? They'll tend to get very angry and walk out of counseling sessions. Uh, uh, that, that I, I'm smiling at that because um, I had a marriage once where um, my husband uh, walked out of a, a counseling session. Uh, They'll tend to shame the victims. And, and this is also can be their children, right? They'll shame their children about anything from their accomplishments to a previous trauma they suffered, or they'll insinuate they somehow deserved it, right? I wouldn't be hitting you if you hadn't done whatever. You know, I wouldn't be treating you this way if you hadn't made, you made me do this to you. Right. right. This is classic, classic gaslighting and really classic parenting in many households. Right. Um, my mother used to say that to me as I as I've been prepping for this show. It was interesting because I don't know that I ever would have. On my own, come to the thought that my mother was a narcissist. I don't tend to like labels. And so um, 
I, I tend to shy away from, from trying to pigeonhole people because I think in many ways things are much more fluid. Um, but in these cases, so, and what I'm talking about are like the people in mental institutions, autistic children, these kinds of labels, I, I think are inappropriate in most cases because I, I think we don't know what's going on. And so we label people and we pigeonhole them and then, and then they're forever stuck in an institution or forever got that label as a kid growing yeah. up and it doesn't help them. On the other hand, uh, it's, I, it, it is important to identify the type of person, especially if you're dealing with someone who is a narcissist or is gaslighting you or is abusing you or being toxic with you in any way. In, in these cases, a, a label is helpful, right? You, you, you can navigate better with the label. But in my own life, this, I'm just saying this is why I have never really thought about her in this way to put a label on her. And I don't know that she was a total narcissist, but uh, certainly there are a lot of these check boxes that I could go, oh, that was my mother, that was my mother, that was my mother. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the whole idea that, you know, I'm mistreating you because you made me. My husband, my first husband did that to me too. You know, I wouldn't have had an affair. You made me have an affair. Yeah, uh, it, it reminds me of one of Neil Donald Walsh's conversations with God, where God basically said that no one ever does anything, given their model of the world, that they deem inappropriate. But also, no one ever does anything that they don't want to do. On some level. At some level. You have to have wanted to do it because you did it. If you truly didn't want to do it, you wouldn't have done it. Right. There is no middle ground here. It's not that I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Then you wanted to do it. So as the parent is hitting you saying, you know, I'm only doing this because you did that. That's, that's gaslighting. That's just BS. Yeah. There are always other approaches you can take than resorting to physical violence. And if we don't, as a society, buy into that idea and pursue it, things won't change. And we will continue to create this ongoing chain of pain. We will continue to pass on to our children our own brokenness. And... and Go ahead, Mary. You got, you got something? I was just going to say a really crucial aspect here is we have to teach people how to deal with their difficult emotions. Because I know that when I get really upset, sometimes it's like, what can I do with all this anger, or frustration, you know? And I might pound on a stack of pillows on the bed because I need a physical release and I'm not going to punch a wall or a person or, you right. know, kick a dog. Or right, smack a kid, but right? Like, if people don't know other ways to deal with right. this stuff, exactly, you know, yes. that's yes. certainly been modeled enough. Go pick a bar, right? And fight with somebody, go ahead, make my day, right? Right, hi, Heather, thank you for joining us. Um. Yes, exactly, Mary. And that's and that's really that's why we're talking about this, right? Because we've got to figure out a way through this process so that we can break this chain of pain and stop creating more brokenness in our world through our children. And so, you know, one of the things that um, it, that that we can do in the moment is to just stop and breathe and 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 take an introspective moment when we start to feel like something's going haywire and remember if we can in that moment not to allow our housing to dictate our response because most people are not 
in touch with the differentiation between their soul and spirit and their housing, their bodies. And, and their bodies, our bodies are being driven by our defense mechanisms and our ego as a mechanism to protect us. And so when we start to feel some kind of rage within our body, that's not our soul. That's not our spirit. That's our housing reacting to what's around us, reacting to the frequency around us, reacting to our own memories, reacting to memories in other lifetimes. And we're getting jerked around by our housing. So that's why I think one of the first steps in learning how to break this chain of pain is to get centered and to learn how in that moment to, to, to identify, okay, I can feel a real discomfort in my body. Right. That's a signal to me. That's a signal to me to stop. Yeah. And, think. and the problem with this suggestion, I, and I'm fully aware of it, is that we don't like to feel. We don't like to feel. That takes things. into this uncomfortable place. And because we're not well-versed on how our housing is actually manipulating us, I mean, it's also helping us and it's doing great things for us, but it's also unconsciously, unconscious to us, also influencing us and manipulating us. And when we're not conscious of that, then we're not truly being ourselves in the moment. We're being something manufactured in, in, in between our head and the rest of us that comes out as whatever it might come out as. But without that focus of, you know, I'm really here to be hope, love, and grace with each other. And so how do I respond in this situation from that place? Because that's what I'm here to be. Our bodies are sort of reactive mechanisms. Stuff right. happens externally and our body has a physical reaction. And that's just sort of the instinctive physical thing that happens. And to right. be able to get to a place where we can respond bringing in our intellect and our spirit and everything, we have to have that break. We have to have like the pause. And that's where breathing is helpful. For me, a lot of the time I just look and go, oh, okay, my body is in an uproar. Like, sub, you know, the trolley is always my example or the bus, like people on there are playing music loud or just like, being raucous. There were two dogs the other day that were a little, uh, you know, people are, it's fine to bring your dog on. You should make sure your, your dog is really well trained and not everybody does. And when you get two of those there at the same time, it can be a little iffy. So, you know, those kinds of things make my body go, oh, danger, Will Robinson. So you go to alert. And so right. it's really important is to bring your conscious awareness into that moment. And that's what's the hard part. And I think, you know, can you think of something other than breathing? Or like, what are good ways to help us bring our consciousness into those moments of activation? And part of it is just practice. The more you practice, first you have to notice. Notice that you're activated. I think most right. people don't even get to that step. They just right. blow up and explode. And God knows right. I've been one of those people. So right. I'm not judging. I'm speaking right. from past right. experience. Right. So that right there is the first step, just being able to be aware. And you talk about this, Linda, you know, the just being aware of the physical body as right. like the housing you say. Right. But remember that the housing is an animal. Right. You know, it's not right. our mind. It's not right. a machine. Right. It's a living 
animal, like right. your dog or your right. cat who hears right. something strange right. and has a fearful reaction. Right. Dogs are good examples, I think, because I've been watching Caesar Milan a lot. And the thing I have learned is the dog gets its energy from the human. So if you are modeling what he calls calm, conf calm confidence, right. your dog will be confident. Right. And when it gets all jumpy and barky and protective of you, it's because it's feeling your nervousness. So maybe right. if we start thinking of our bodies as like that little dog. <laughs> right, right. And we have to model the calm confidence from our spirit right. to our bodies so that we can be right. calm. You know, right. calm surrender is what he says you want the dogs to be. And I right. know we got to practice for a little while before our little dog died. But it was amazing to me to see how much difference it made when I just walked back into the room like, okay, now you're going to come walk with me. Instead of walking back there, calling her name to try to wake her up and clapping my hands at her to wake her up, that stuff just created this atmosphere of chaos. Right. And when I walked back there and just was like, you know, come on, she would get up and come. <laughs> right, right. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think that the I think the real key in all of this is for us as individuals to learn how to feel that separation between what's happening in the housing and who we are as a being. Yes. The housing is what does the doing what runs this, what us, the, the thing that animates this is us and, and we're the being. And a lot of times people just allow their housing to run them. Yeah. You know, I'm hungry. I'm going to eat. I'm going to, you know, and, and maybe not give any thought to the fact that, gee, I just ate an hour ago. You know, if, if we just give in to these physical impulses and allow the housing to take over, and many people are, are just living their lives that way, not even cognizant that this isn't them, and, and that they really do have a responsibility to explore that separation so that they can be who they truly want to be and not this housing, which is predominantly run by fear. Right. Right. So I had a long conversation with a young man last night who has a lot going on in his life. You know, he's got a, a, a fairly important high level job. He his, he's got to find a place to move to in a town where that's difficult. Uh, he's, you know, put out job applications to all kinds of places in and out of state, thinking that he would find something and then that would deal with the fact that he has to move, you know, so, but none of the timing of it's come together. And in the midst of all of that, he's somehow gotten himself into a relationship. And not only that, but she's works in the same place where he works. And not only that, but she has two kids and not only that, but there's other stuff going on and you know he he just was like just couldn't focus on anything all of it was just so much and what i could see in him was that his entire fear mechanism in his housing had taken over and all of these things that were unknowns were just jacking him around and making him absolutely crazy. When in fact, what's really happening for each of us is in every moment is perfection. In every moment is, is divinity to be felt. And what, what we, he was experiencing was basically the fear that his housing was generating of all the unknowns, everything was unknown. Right. Where's he gonna live? Who's he gonna be with? How's all this gonna work out? That's all just fear. 
gripping him and and making him not literally crazy, but really just really agitating him to a way where he's not sleeping, he's not eating well, he's, he doesn't feel good. And it's fear. And fear from our housing is what most people are being run by on a daily basis, and they have no idea. And this is applies to all these toxic parents and narcissists, because all of that toxicity has a root in fear. That if we come back to our principal core teaching, the only thing that truly exists here is divine love and the physical appearance of creation of this 3D world through a process of divine love. That's the only thing that exists. Anything that looks different than that or feels different than that is a lack of love. Fear is nothing more than a lack of love. And so all of this toxicity stems from that. And another, yeah, another thing I wanted to say was the same way that we are not our bodies, we are not our thoughts. And that's yeah. really important to remember because the fear that grips our body, as you mentioned, turns up all these thoughts in our head. And right. We are, you know, I know I used to identify with the thoughts in my head. I used to think right. that they were real and they were me in some way. And they mattered, right. you know, right. I used to think they were important things. And, you know, right. sometimes you might have a thought that matters, an idea for something you're going to create. Those are the kinds of thoughts that mostly matter or right. like the love you're going to give to somebody. Those thoughts matter too. Right. But like all of these doom scenarios and, oh my God, did he say this? Did she mean that? What, what was that about? Even honestly, just yesterday I was telling someone heather about how somebody who works here hates me and i was kind of half joking and then this morning you know that same person saw me as we were going and was like hi mary called the door open and said oh i like your sparkles you know and i'm like thank you and i'm like maybe she doesn't even really hate me you know but like the way that our minds can take one tiny little thing and blow it out of proportion right and like you say that stuff is all fear you know, right. and the like the opposite of love is fear. We fear things that we don't understand. And so then we're afraid to love, you right. know, we're afraid to be that open, vulnerable, love light being, because what if someone rejects us or doesn't understand us or blah, de, blah, de, blah. And yeah, so that's right. what I have to say right now. Take it away. Right. Lisa. <laughs> well, or blames us, right? That this is one of the most toxic things in my mind that a parent can do is to blame their children for their experience, you yes. know, for yeah. whatever. Um, mm -hmm. This is an interesting article on um, Scary Mommy, uh, yeah. 16 Characteristics of Highly Toxic Parents. And so I'm just going to read the bullets. Um, they expect their kids to agree with them about everything or practically everything. They don't see their children as autonomous individuals, they, meaning they see their children as extensions of themselves. Yeah. And a lot of parents, this doesn't have to be toxic. The, the notion of a mini-me. And yet, and, and I know many, many mothers who, you know, who, who like that, who want that, who dreamt of that, and who, who raise their children that way, that they have a mini me. But the problem with that, where the toxicity comes in is, is that it really can deny the child their own self-expression. Right. And and that's when it becomes toxic. That's not to say that there aren't children 
who want to be the mini me yeah. on their own. And if the child on their own wants to be the mini me, well, then everybody's happy and there's no toxicity to be concerned about. But I know when I was little, my mother wanted me to be her mini me. And I failed her miserably. And she let me know it. Really. Uh, so three, they don't believe in a child's privacy. Uh, and, and that can be, that can be especially toxic for children who are um, having any kind of, you know, sexual identity concerns, not feeling, uh, not feeling that they want to be in the gender that they are or the body that they are or just wanting to be able to close the door and have quiet time by themselves and not feel intruded upon. I, I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing for a child to be able to say, you know, I just like some alone time and to be able to trust that their parent wouldn't come barging in their room in the middle of that. But there are a lot of parents that adopt an attitude of it's my house I'm paying for it. I'll come in here whenever I damn well, please. You know, um, they disclose or they discipline out of anger or fear. Uh, they're often more judgmental of their own kids than anyone else's. They want their kids to follow in their own footsteps or live out their unfulfilled dreams. They're uncomfortable when their kid is happy. Um, I want to read a little on this. Uh, as What they say here is, as much as people love to say that all parents want the best for their kids, many of us know that isn't true. Some toxic parents aren't happy when their kids are happy. They may be jealous or resentful. Uh, they may wish that they never had kids and they simply aren't able to get past their own feelings uh, to give their offspring what they need. I, I, I do know of one mom that uh, is, is anxious for her child to grow up because she feels like her life has been uh, totally changed and in a way that she doesn't care for. Uh, everything is about uh, them and their feelings. And see that, so that's, uh, you know, they keep score. Uh, their kids aren't allowed to ask questions or express honest feelings. They use guilt to get their way. Uh, they withhold love and affection as a form of punishment. This is a very common thing. Way too common. You know, uh, when a kid makes a mistake, a kid makes a mistake. We should never withdraw our love or withhold our love from them as a form of punishment. That is like one of the most heartbreaking things uh, a, a parent can do, I think. They make mountains out of molehills. They expect the worst of their own kids. Um, and this can be this can be tricky to navigate. Uh, I can say for myself with, uh, you know, stepkids, sometimes, or in my case, stepkids, it could be your own kids. It could be grandkids. If someone becomes, let's say, a repeat offender, it can be very difficult to not allow that to influence you in your future treatment of them. It's, it, you know, you get into a point where it becomes cyclical and, and you can end up expecting the worst because the worst keeps happening, right? So it, it, this is different. This is a, a, a narcissist will do this because they don't have any respect for anybody other than themselves, really. And so it's easy for a narcissist to just always expect the worst out of people. I want to um, reply to one of the things you said before about using withholding love as a punishment. Yeah. yeah. It's like 
that is the most hurtful thing you can do to a child, I think, as a parent, because right. you are supposed to be the source of unconditional right. love right. for that child. Right. And that's the only way that kid feels safe. Right. To really truly mature. I right. think that's why so many of us are so wounded because the love is really conditional. Right. And right. what we need when we're children is that unconditional positive regard, that unconditional love and acceptance. And no matter what you do, it won't make me think less of you. Like, you know, as a child. Right. That's right. really what we need from our parents is that right. blanket. Anyway, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, and um, I do think that that withdrawal of love and um, withholding of love is, is, uh, it's the it is it's I think it's the worst thing it's the worst thing we can do to anybody yeah right we've talked about this in other segments like the the notion of um so I'm not going to talk to you I'm mad yeah. at you so I'm not going to talk to you yeah and um, trying to live with someone in a house where they are actively not talking to you yeah I remember being that way when I was little I'd get mad at my dad yeah when you're little, and that you was, don't know any better but right. But the thing I would discover was I could, I, I could never stay mad like that. Like I would say, okay, I'm mad at him and, and I'm not going to talk to him. I'm not going to go, but he was like the only, he was the only one there besides my mother. And so if I was going to go hang out with somebody, I'd end up going out, going and hanging out with him and watching yeah. him in his, in his workshop and, yeah. you know, with whatever carpentry thing he was doing at the time. And, um, and I go, well, I'm just, I'll just sit here. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> and then, you know, I don't know. And then like at dinner, we'd be sitting there and I go, ah, I was, I was going to not talk to him. Yeah. I, <laughs> so I completely forget. <laughs> when I was little, I would do that whole flounce into my room and slam the door thing when I got mad. And it was definitely with the idea that I was never going to talk to that person again, whoever it was, mom, <laughs> dad, brother, sister. But then right. you, all, you could never stay in your room forever. You know, you'd right. get hungry. You'd have to rejoin the family right. at some point. Right. And I found that experience so humiliating as a little girl. You know, it's like, oh, no, now I have to let go of all this anger and go back out there and be civilized. Probably didn't say civilized because I probably didn't know that word yet, but you know what I mean. So right. I quit doing that because I didn't like having to recover from my high dudgeon. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I wanted to read this comment from yes. one of our users, which says, because it does, that ties in really well to one of the things we've said in a previous slide, which was the only sin is to be unloving. Right, right. Right. Yeah, I'm not a big believer in the word sin, but if we're going to have them, that's the only sin that exists. Yeah. Right. That's my feeling. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just finish this list here because yeah. there are a couple, a couple more uh, uh, bullets, just two more. They expect their children to perform. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and that, uh, that that's you know expecting too much for your kids right do this do that be this be that they often uh care excessively about appearances and don't care so much about what their kid has learned or whether or not they're a happy or well-adjusted kid they just want their kid to impress other people right um yeah i almost think that was part of that was a bit of my mom and then they take no blame and they make no apologies. Um, hang on a second. I need to clear my throat here. Yeah, that last one, um, take no blame and make no apologies. Uh, definitely, uh, that's also narcissistic behavior, right? I'm perfect. There's nothing wrong with me. Um, don't suggest there's anything wrong with me. In a way, uh, I think 
I think yeah. that's kind of society wide. I'm thinking right now in a way, like, you know, when these people get caught out in scandals and all it would take is saying, oh, I did that and I was wrong and I've learned, you know, when it was 30 years ago, not last week. But instead, it's this insistence that they can't even begin to own anything they did. I think that's like a ne neuroses in our society. Maybe it's right. that people think it's, you know, weak to acknowledge yeah. that you're yeah. human and made a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here, are, uh, uh, it's a diff this is a different article. Uh, how to tell if you have a toxic parent. Uh, so what are the traits? Uh, this is a Dr. Child says, here are the traits to look for. Self-centered behavior, physical abuse, spanking, uh, any kind of that. Screaming, uh, verbal abuse, screaming, yelling, name calling, blaming are all uh, examples. Emotional abuse. So, uh, for example, giving a kid the silent treatment after they've done something wrong. Um, blaming the child, making the child feel like it's their fault, uh, especially in the case of things like marital problems. You know, if the father is a drunk, the, the mother might blame the kid. Well, it's your fault he drinks, that kind of thing. Uh, manipulation. Uh, a lot of times they'll, you know, a, a parent will manipulate your, your kid. Um, their kid and an Ill inability to respect boundaries for example like going in their room but but maybe even also physical boundaries um, these are all signs of uh, uh, a toxic parent the effects though of toxic parenting are important to identify as well so a, a kid will feel trapped uh, the the impact on themselves will end up impacting their future relationships because their their behavior and their responses will be influenced by having lived with a parent who was so toxic. Um, and, and then we should talk about also what, you know, so how do you cope with that? How do you cope with that? If you find, if you're living in a toxic household right now, what do you do? Um, and I, I think the number one thing to do is to, is to seek support. Find someone that you can confide in, that you can talk to, that you can share these problems with and allow them to assist you. That might be a school counselor. It might be a school nurse. Uh, it might be the parent of one of your friends. It could be, uh, it it could be somebody in a religious institution. If your family, you know, goes to church uh, or synagogue or or something like that, mosque, there may be somebody there that could help you. There are also uh, organizations. You can uh, use the internet to uh, search in your area for. Uh, you know, teen support. Uh, there are different organizations depending on the area, even a girl, boys and girls club in your area, a YMCA or a YWCA. Uh, if you, if you're not finding anything, uh, go to the local library and ask the librarian. She'll know. Uh, or go to a local clinic. That would be another, call a local clinic or a mental health clinic. Um, any of those kinds of places will be able to assist you in finding somebody. Um, start with a girlfriend or a boyfriend if that's as close as you, you have. You know, maybe that's all you can do at that point. But talk to somebody share your experiences and and 
um, or reach out to us. You know, we're always here. You can always use the number on your screen, 1-907-351-3003. You might not get me in the moment, but leave me a message and I'll call you back. Send me a text message. Uh, send an email to questions at walkingthroughyourwalls.com or send one to Mary, Mary uh, laughs loud at gmail.com. But get, reach out to somebody. That's the first step. Reach yes. out to somebody and get some kind of support. Start the process of getting just somebody whose shoulder you can lean on. Because especially if, if you're experiencing the, the kind of narcissistic behavior where your parents are blaming you and, and telling or gaslighting you, telling you things that aren't true, saying things about you that don't feel right. You know, many of you have heard the story that I tell about my aunt that used to beat me and, uh, and, and spew all kinds of, of things. Um, here goes Ziggy. Um, all kinds of things about me that, that just, they, they weren't true. They weren't, they weren't what I thought. They weren't how I behaved. They weren't anything about me. And yet she would just hurl it at me as a weapon. You, you need to have someone you can can help navigate that, right? That was total gaslighting. If somebody's telling you stuff like that and you know it's not true, it doesn't feel true in your heart, you're never going to change their mind, right? They're not going to listen to you. You're not going to change their mind, although you might be able to stop their behavior by, as I've suggested in the past, just simply agreeing with them will deflate them and will take that the, it's your arguing against it that gives them more power and, and, and enrages them. So you just say, yeah, you're right. You're right. Whatever you think that's right. And, and, and it, the, it'll, it'll stop the behavior. It won't solve the problem. The problem's still there, but the behavior will at least stop and you can take a breather and maybe figure out a way to navigate away from that relationship. You need to set boundaries, you know, realizing that you can heal. You don't have to buy into other people's mental illnesses and inappropriateness, right? You may not necessarily think of them as mentally ill, but if they're not healthy, if they're toxic, then there is something mentally unhealthy about them. And you need to be able to, to set boundaries so you don't get sucked up into that. You know, this Dr. Child says, you know, parents don't suddenly change and become untoxic. You have to distance yourself from them in order to heal. And that can be a hard pill to swallow, especially because if you're still living under the roof, depending on how old you are, and, and this, you know, kids are becoming aware of toxicity in their lives at a much earlier age. They're, they're standing up for themselves at a much earlier age than they used to. Um, you may be stuck. I mean, they're your parents. And unless there's some other way for you to live and grow and thrive, somehow you have to stay in that household. But you can find ways to learn to live and grow and thrive even within that household. But it, you'll need help. You'll need help. These are not easy things and not for an adult to navigate, much less a, a younger person. Uh, so and, go well, ahead, Mary. I just wanted to say that in addition to what you're saying, finding someone you can confide in another really important aspect that you touched on is that it's not true. Like don't believe the lies that they're telling right. you about right. yourself, right? Because right. that's where the guilt, the shame right. comes from. And then you'll be afraid to tell somebody anything, right. you right. know, and that's how they keep you prisoner right, right. of their right. toxicity. So it's really important to just recognize that the lies 
that they're telling are not who you are. And like Linda said, you don't need to fight with them about that because you won't be able to change their mind and their right. mind doesn't matter. What matters is your mind and how you feel about yourself. And that's where you can begin to heal is an understanding, you know, those are lies. That's not true. What else might be true? And you don't have to answer that, but just allowing, you know, because when you're grown up in that environment, it can be very hard to short circuit the wiring that's been trying to be installed in you by then, you know? Right. And you may have been programmed to believe some of that stuff. Right. By the time right. you're old enough to really be questioning. Right. So that's that's a really important early step also. Is yes. Separating out yourself from the lies that they tell you about yourself. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and just going back for a moment to the setting boundaries, right? So you, we, you have to let other people know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And um, I can remember when I was uh, 12, 13, 14, uh, my mother was a, a, a severe alcoholic. And she pretty much spent most of her time passed out on the couch. And I can remember coming home from school and standing on the, by the side of the couch and lecturing her on what was appropriate behavior and what was appropriate parenting and how this was not appropriate parenting. And that I shouldn't have to be in charge of all of the shopping the grocery shopping, the cleaning of the house, the meal preparation, and getting good grades at school. Like all of this was just too much. It, it didn't change anything, but it was my attempt to set boundaries. I was, a, that was what I was attempting to do. She, she didn't change her behavior. The universe had to intervene for me, but, um, and it did, it intervened in a big way, um, which is a different story. But, um, you know, it, it is important. And once you get to a point where you can identify and you know, I don't care how old you are, right? Because wisdom, wisdom doesn't care about age. And, and there are some children walking around on this planet right now that are way more wise than many of the adults, many of the even elderly. Um, and so when you know what's right for you, stand up for that stand up for that um and you might be you know be prepared for pushback because adults are not necessarily going to be open to that but i'm really a a, a believer that we need to be our own champions and and that starts at whatever age you begin to feel opinions and choices of your own i can remember when my stepson got his first haircut and he had, and he had something to say about how he wanted it cut. It made me so happy because up until that point, you know, you're doing the responsible thing. You're getting the kid's haircut. So he's, you know, it's not in his eyes and he can see and all of that, but you're just doing it based on your own taste because, you know, they're either pre-verbal or they haven't said. But at the point that one time where he finally said, you know, I want it this way, my heart just burst open because it was like, yes, because our children are individual expressions of divinity. And unless we allow them the space to become who they are, then they're just becoming who we're molding them to be. And that was a moment of him becoming who he was. And it just, it, I just remember it as being a really happy, happy moment. Was, I was like, oh, I, I love it. I just love it. Um, but the most important thing to help you through a toxic relationship with a parent or someone else 
or uh, a narcissist of any kind, whether it's a parent or a grandparent or teacher, whatever, president. Uh, <laughs> um, be well, because what I'm about to say isn't going to totally track with that thrown in there, but the, the healing process starts in here. And so to deal with all of that, you have to focus on yourself and learning how to support yourself and your own dreams and your own desires in spite of the toxicity that may be around you, in spite of the, the abuse you may be enduring, right? And, and let's go ahead and talk for just, we only have a couple minutes left, but let's touch on this, the idea of not only are they narcissistic or toxic, but they're abusive. So they beat you or they, you know, uh, in other ways, abuse you mentally uh, or physically. They will try and tell you it's your fault, right? It's your fault I'm doing this. It's your fault I'm hitting you. You made me do this. And you, as we touched on earlier, you've really, really got to cultivate the wisdom that you are divinity. And when other people are speaking, it is a reflection of them and not you. You did not make anybody hit you. You didn't make anybody do anything to you, abuse you in any way, shape or form. You didn't make that happen. Nobody does anything they don't want to do. They are wanting to do this. You didn't bring it to you. You didn't make it happen to you. It isn't the universe punishing you for something you did in this lifetime or some other lifetime. None of those teachings are accurate and it's not how life is working right so just as a recap because i don't we don't say it every show um but as a recap we are all here to create heaven on earth through being hope love and grace in service to one another that's why we're here and so these people that may be in your life they're not living that way. I can guarantee you 99.99% .99 of them are not living that way. But you can begin to live that way. And what you'll, what you'll discover is that the more you make a point of living that way, the more these things will fall away. Because the two are not energetically compatible. And so things will have to adjust. The universe will have to adjust. Things will change. Because you are bringing forth your sole purpose. And, and the universe will, will feel that and see that. And instantly, things will be more supportive and easier for you. The moment we each embrace our sole purpose, a light switch flips and things start to become easier so we're just a minute or two out um mary did you have anything you wanted to wrap with i don't really have anything right now <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, to, you can go to my website, lindalamp.com. That's L-Y-N-D-A-L-A-M-P.com or uh, lindalamp.shop, either one. You can email me at questions at walkingthroughyourwalls.com. You can call or text 1907-351-3003. You can reach out to Mary at marylastloud at gmail.com. And we'll see you here next week. If you have questions, uh, please send them in one way or the other, and uh, we'll take them up next week. Thanks again, everybody. Glad to be here. 
Love you. Namaste.